Our next speaker, Terry Cross, is, uh, is a Seneca, and as a Mohawk, we share a birthright as members of the Six Nations uh, or Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And so we are rel relatives. And his, his traditional name is Hanegahno, which is water watcher. And uh, um, he has, for over 30 years, he helped found the National Indian Child Welfare Association in the United States, served as his executive director for 30 years, put in place a four, an actual, real live, four-year secession training and mentoring process for the new executive director and continues to serve as the senior advisor. And so please help me uh, welcome uh, my relative and uh, to help us carry the water of our work, so to speak, Terry Cross. And do I, I'm assuming that my PowerPoint will be up here. Good. Good morning, everyone. What a pleasure to be here um, and to be a witness to the events. Um, and I hope uh, that my words this morning uh, will do justice to what you've already heard, because this is, uh, we're in important territory. This is an important conversation about the social determinants of health. And you're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about the context that we're all in. And I want to set the frame by talking about what I see as the five conditions for any colonial power to us achieve and maintain and sustain dominance over the indigenous population. So first of all, they've got to take the land. And second of all, take control of the natural resources, particularly food and water. Now this is a pattern that's uh, been repeated all around the world, wherever colonialism was manifest. Because if you can control the food and the water, you can control, largely control the people. You have to take away the sovereignty or disrupt the leadership and the governance of the indigenous people. Most often it's treated like it doesn't exist. But you usurp the sovereignty and say you have to live under our governance. The fourth item here is that you have to take away the legitimacy of thought, of worldview, of spirituality, of language, and of healing practices, and say, your way of thinking is no longer legitimate. You have to operate by our way of thinking. And finally, they have to take away the children. Because taking away the children so disrupts the social fabric of any society that it's awfully hard to recover. It breaks down the social norms. People don't act very well when they don't have children present. It disrupts the family. It disrupts the norms of society. It disrupts health creating those social determinants that we see in our society today. So taken together, these five elements of colonization create an environment that I guarantee will make people sick. Because this is an environment of trauma. This is an environment where things can go so terribly wrong that we experience trauma on a daily basis. Whether it's the residential school experience, and these pictures are from the United States, we share that experience across the border. 
or whether it's in the form of the loss of languages or the loss of life ways or we end up with a system with a set of symptoms resulting from this, col this colonial, colonial experience. And I believe we live in a post-colonial society. We live in constant environment in which the dynamics generated by this colonial history still operate with us. And that post-colonial environment is characterized by intergenerational trauma, by lateral oppression and violence in our own communities, internalized racism, and self-blame. You see, those five elements of, of colonization are based in a lie. They're based at, in the great colonial lie. And the great colonial lie is it's okay to take what, other, what belongs to other people, whether it's land or governance or children. It's simply wrong. And it was justified by the doctrine of discovery on the United States manifest destiny or whatever law was used to justify it was wrong. We have been treated as subhuman beings. That is a lie. And the lie has been so thoroughly perpetrated on our peoples that sometimes we start to believe it. And so when we start to believe it, and there's not much we can do about it, we often turn on one another. And so identity politics is part of this post-colonial society, where we argue about who's really in and who's out. I talked about the dismembership of social norms. Our societies were some of the healthiest societies in the world, both physically and emotionally, because we had cultural teachings that taught us how to live, how to be with one another. You heard, heard about them here. And culture is so much more than the outward things that we can see. Culture is what lives in our hearts in how we treat one another. But a colonial society that's based in a credo of greed, of taking what doesn't belong to you, of establishing dominance and control, it eats at the heart of people who know the right way to live. We are not stupid people. We are not lesser beings. There is nothing wrong with indigenous people. We are a people who are, we are peoples who are survivors of cultural genocide. And what we see manifest today is the product of trauma. The adverse childhood experiences that we understand today are directly generated through that colonial experience and manifested today in the form of child abuse, violence against women, violence against one another, lateral oppression, oppression by mainstream, 
discrimination, prejudice, you name the whole long list, and you end up with those social determinants of health bearing down on us in a way that causes us to be sick. Theta Newbrest from the Blackfeet Nation has said, colonization dismembered our culture, dismembered our people, dismembered our families. Our job is remembering. Our job is remembering. Now the double entendre here is intentional, remembering our culture, but putting ourselves back together through that remembering. Our job is decolonizing. Our job is to reject the colonial lie. Our job is to say no more. Because if you're going to change the social determinants of health from being destructive to being health-promoting, you, we have to stop the trauma as it exists today. There's parts of that that we don't have much control over, but there's a great deal of it we have control over. We can stop injuring one another. We can stop injuring one another in our families. We can stop injuring one another in our services. We can stop injuring one another in our leadership. And we can stop the injury of unnecessary removals of our children that tear at the fabric of our culture by continuing to dismember our social norms. Any unnecessary removal of a child from their family is a trauma. Any intervention that compounds the problem is a trauma. Any separation that removes children from our communities and takes them far away is a trauma. Not just a trauma for the child, who's already experienced the trauma of neglect, or a parent who's abusing substances, or has experienced physical or sexual abuse, that's a trauma enough but to be removed at distance and not have access to the people who love you and care for you deepens and hardens the trauma. Our post-colonial realities are racial inequities, economic insecurity, all those poor outcomes for our children that are accepted and barriers to self-determination. Now, when if that colonial process had been in, if it were in the past, people sometimes say to me, why don't you get over it? My response is, I'll get over it when you stop it. Because when a government says to a First Nation or a tribe, you can run your own services, but you've got to run them just like we run them. Your people have to have the same credentials as we have. You have to follow our rules. You have to... It's a, it's a continuation of that delegitimizing of thought. It's an... I have not ever been to a First Nation community or a tribe in the United States when, where people did not want safety for their children. Never. And somehow government agencies 
have this underlying belief that if we run our own services in the way that we think our families need them, that our children won't be safe. That poison of colonialism that says that thought is superior, that training is superior because it's white, because it's European, because it's Western, is a continuation of the great colonial lie. Now, we are learning to have dialogue. We are learning to come together because we have major problems to solve. <laughs> In our communities, we experience poverty, substance misuse, poor parenting, poor housing, and the overrepresentation of our children in the child welfare system can be directly linked to these items. To the disparities that were created by colonialism and the ones that we then see perpetuated by a lack of structural interventions to address them. But Is child welfare, is the standard intervention? Is, is this a setup for failure? Is poor housing, poverty, untreated mental health problems, and particularly trauma, substance use disorders, are these things that any one individual family can do much about? No, but the whole child welfare system in the United States and in Canada and Europe is based in a system of rescue and police. Child, the child welfare system grew out of the SPCA, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And the assumption in child welfare is that the family has the tools to solve the problems. It puts the safety of the child paramount in the system, and the state steps in, and I'm using that term broadly, the government steps in when the family fails to protect the safety and well-being of the child. It assumes then, in a linear fashion, that the family can do something about it. So you write a case plan and the, the family complies with the case plan, maybe they'll get their child back. A case plan that's nearly impossible to complete given the post-colonial environment that we live in. It assumes that the system is a better parent. And in the, the way things have done, been done in the post-colonial society, it assumed that the white system was the better parent. So we take a look at this. Some of you may have attended the international gathering in Niagara on the River in 2005, the Truth and Reconciliation meeting of child welfare professionals and that meeting established something called the Touchstones of Hope, and I know there's been Touchstones of Hope initiatives here in British Columbia. We refer to it at NICWA as the relational worldview model, and I'm going to say a little bit about, more about that in a few minutes. But in this model of child welfare, the system engages the family. The tribe steps in when the family can't assure safety, but it assumes that the family, with support, and more broadly the extended family, the kinship ne network, is the better family. And so the system steps in to create an environment in which children can be safe. It doesn't establish a rescue model that abandons the family at, 
in the name of trying to protect the child. The touchstones of hope were five principles that were established to transform Aboriginal child welfare to a model that would be helpful to families to create safe places for children and to decolonize child welfare. Those five elements are self-determination, basing services on culture and language, being holistic in approaches, using structural interventions, making sure that both funding and services were non-discriminatory. Tribes are in the best position to decide what's best for their children. As I said, I've never been to a tribal community where you ask about child safety and they can't tell you what it means to keep a child safe. It, we have to embrace what hurts in our communities. In other words, if we're going to solve problems, I heard it last night, I think it was Willie who said, you've got to own your own stuff. And in, in order to solve this, we got a lot of raggedy stuff we got to fix, and it's got to start in our own families, in our own hearts, our own selves. But our culture teaches us how to do that. We know how to do that. And we know how to heal. We have to make sure that our efforts are linked with our own economic well-being because our land and our children, our resources in our children, our leadership in our children, our language in our children, they're one. It's all one. We have to be, be able to rely on the wisdom of our teachings about, the, about children's place in the world. We know how to do this. Every tribal teaching I've ever encountered ac across the United States and Canada has at its heart the right way to live, the right way to teach you, to, to be with one another, the right way to treat your children, remembering. Being holistic in our approaches, we can't intervene in child abuse or neglect and not address the trauma, the health, the housing, the economic well-being. We need to engage our communities in the problem solving. We need to be cautious about adopting mainstream ways to fix our communities when we know what works in our communities. Imposition of things like evidence-based practice. I believe in science. I believe in science to practice. But when you require indigenous communities to implement things that have developed in a, in a university someplace far away, it's the latest wave of colonial impression if it keeps us from doing what we know helps and heals our families. Structural interventions, in other words, dealing with the poverty dealing with the mental health issues, dealing with the substance abuse issues, making sure that our programs have access to the resources needed to do this work. Colonialism created the problem. Our own struggles with the outcomes of that often keep us mired there. But the starvation, the starvation 
of the spirits of our people to be able to solve our problems lie at the feet of the colonial powers. The process is still going on. The process still going on. Well, I want to share some hopeful things with you. The village of Queek, it's known for short because it's hard for outsiders to pronounce. A, a tribal elder there, his name is Andrew Beaver, 10 years ago created a child protection team. That the, in Alaska, the solution to child welfare problems was for an airplane to fly in, for social workers to load kids onto a plane, take them to Anchorage, and they would never be seen again. Despite the Indian Child Welfare Act, despite a whole lot of things, and the placement rates for Native kids in Alaska was astronomical. 60% of the kids in the system were na Native kids. Only 17% of the state is Native. So Andrew and the tribal government at Quig said, we want to stop this because it's the it's perpetuating the trauma. So they created a child protection team to handle their own child welfare issues. And they decided they didn't want people to have to call the hotline. They didn't want to wait till there were bruises or there was an abandonment. They wanted to identify the members of their families who were in trouble. So they formed their own child protection team. And it could be re, uh, renamed the child safety team. They started a process, and now and it goes on. They haven't had a placement outside of their village in the last eight years. Because when they hear of a party, or they hear of a domestic dispute, members of the child protection team, often Andrew himself, they go, two of them at least, and they knock on the door. And when somebody comes to the door, the first question is, is everybody all right? How many child protection workers start with the phrase, is everybody all right? It's certainly a different way to think about it. And what the community has done is establish a, a standard for safety. And the elders of that community and the professionals of that community, the service providers of that community have united and said, this is how we want to live. And if people violate those standards, they get a knock on their door. And they, they ask if everybody's all right. And then they say, we just want you to know we're watching. We want you to know what the standard, what we want for children in our community. And if you need help, we can give you help. We're here for you. But it's not OK to have a party with your kids present. You see, they've, they've tapped into something that I think is so important to all of us. Across, the, across nations that I've visited, when you boil down the basic teachings of how we ought to be with one another, it's about love, it's about generosity, it's about gratitude, it's about kindness, but it's also about courage. And we have examples, we know historically, 
that the courage of our people has been fierce. But there's no act that takes more courage than stepping up to a relative and saying no more. This is not okay. Just stepping up to your own family, to your own neighbor, and saying, we have a standard for how our children should be kept safe. These are acts of courage and Andrew and his team. Well, Andrew was one of the leaders of a project that, we, that the National Indian Child Welfare Association led across the state of Alaska with 16 tribal entities, um, some of them regional corporations representing, one of them represented 56 tribes, so we had over 100 tribes represented in this project. The project was to try to bring down that disproportionate rate of placement. So we began to convene the tribal managers from the child welfare uh, programs. How do you do something across almost 100 tribes or over 100 tribes and not have a cookie cutter approach? Well, the, the managers and tribal leaders has decided to establish a standard for how to approach child welfare in their communities. And to base that on child safety rather than child protection. They developed a set of eight core strategies that they could agree on that if every community addressed those eight core strategies, they would be supporting families and keeping children safe. And they wanted to knit that together in a system of care. And I'll say a bit more about that in a little while. And it would require cross-system collaboration. So here's the service, here's the basic model that they created. They said, if we create in-home service models, like Andrew's child protection team, that it was already in place, we can prevent a lot of the out-of-home placements. We can say to the state, when you fly in here, you don't come in without a tribal leader rep being represented, and we're going to we're going to come up with the plan as a community for our families. No more flying in, flying out. Nobody knows where the child went. So, with safety at the core, they created these elements, these eight elements to address. Every community could develop its own local practice model. They, and they decided to do a written practice, practice model that the state could understand because this legitimacy of thought issue, we have to address that, we have to face that. If we're going to be seen as legitimate, we have to interface with government agencies that fund, um, that uh, we partner with in court environments, and with these local service models being nested in a system of care. So here's what it, it started to look like. And I've got this a little bit bigger. It was based, so everything was based in this core standard. We took, we had four years to do this. <clears throat> it said if we were gonna get kids safe, you had to address, somebody had to coordinate it, so there's a, a case management model it had to address parent, parenting support, parenting skills, healthy relationships, sobriety. We had to deal with domestic violence. Had to have an element of cultural strengths and tapping into the cultural strengths in the community. Had to address the basic needs, the housing, the poverty issues. And people had to have life skills in order to make all of this work. And child welfare couldn't do it by itself. And the tribes couldn't do it by themselves. So the tribes had to be in partnership with the state, with the courts, the healthcare providers, the mental health, behavioral health providers, 
the cultural resources. TANF is the temporary assistance for needy families. That's a, the uh, income assistance, child care, uh, higher education. So this, all of these pieces had to be knitted together because no one person could do it. Well, the state told us, well, these services don't exist out in tribal communities. Well, this is one of the reasons the state was flying in and taking our kids out, because they just didn't know what the services were in our communities. When we started, we started meeting in communities with service providers and elders and care providers, families, and youth. It's so important to have the youth involved in this process because they figured out things that they could do. We had youth at one of our gatherings, and they said during uh, our meeting, you know, one of the problems is that the young fathers don't have a chance to get together, and we don't have activities. So the youth created a softball league for young dads. And they put together the softball with parenting education for the young dads. And it was driven by a group of seven young people in partnership with the Tribal Child Welfare Office. Because they were part of this decolonizing process that said, we don't want our, we don't want our kids to go anymore. So this process coming together, laying a foundation, talking about decolonizing child welfare, asking, presenting the model that it had developed across the state. What does that look like? Discussion and brainstorming. Ask, answering the question, what is a safe child in our community? What do we need to do to keep kids in our community safe? What no longer Believing the lie that in order for our children to be safe, a non-native has to fly in on an airplane and take our kid away. That is a huge colonial lie that we don't have the capacity to keep our own children safe. People wondered, well, what does that look like? How can we do that? Where are these services? We took the eight elements and we staffed family after family after family with our local child welfare departments, with invited the partners. Now what we discovered was even though the bubbles would have names like behavioral health, the staff would say, oh, you know, Eddie over there uh, does a parenting course, and oh, they have a domestic violence program, or they, you know, Sally over here does safe homes, and they knew it by the names of people who did different things, and some of them wore two or three hats. I'm talking about communities that ranged from 300 people to 600 people, the largest 1,000 people. Coming up with strategies who was willing to do what? In one community, we had a group of elders come forward. And one elder stood up. She said, I used to be the village safety officer. I can help. Another one said, you know, I used to serve on tribal council. I can help. They started mentoring. Now what this whole process is based on is having eyes and ears every day on children. Because the way to keep children safe is to make sure that people are with them, that there are eyes and ears on children every day. Now, there will always be children who need to be removed from people who harm them. We have bad actors out there. We have people who've learned horrible ways of treating children. 
but you can reduce the number of children who have to be re removed from their families dramatically by keeping eyes and ears on them every day. And it's coming together as community, it's coming together as providers, it's coming together as extended families with an overt conscious decision to keep those eyes and ears on children. In the village of Nome, or in the city of Nome, uh, the Nome Eskimo community implemented their in home services model. They had a foster home disrupt. The mother of the child was actively drinking. She'd been in and out of recovery. So there was a discussion amongst the team. They all knew this mom. And they thought that she had what it took to get straight and sober. So they went to her home and they said, you know, your child has to be moved. We think that you could take care of him. And if you'll go to AA, if you'll go to treatment, and, and get and stop drinking, we will move the children, the child home with you. And one of our staff will go with you to AA meeting every day. And we know AA is done one day at a time, so we're going to do this placement one day at a time. And, and someone will be in your home with you every day while you do this process. She agreed, the child went home. The worker went with her, and somebody from the staff or a volunteer from the community who was working with them went with the mom every day to AA. That was eight years ago. The child stayed home. If you tell that mom, that same mom, be straight and sober for six months and maybe you'll get your child back, how often does that work? Not so often. Now they took a risk, but the risk was lower because they could have eyes and ears on the child every single day. That all of the providers that were part of these networks were part of that decision-making process. The, the child's school knew, the healthcare provider knew was part of the plan. The counselor knew and was part of the plan. The minister at the church knew and was part of the plan. That's what I mean by a system of care. That the case plan actually laid out who was going to do what and somebody was guiding that process. And in their service model, the tribe incorporated their traditional teachings, their cultural principles and values in their definition of what a safe child was. And they created this service model that says, this is how we keep children safe. They discovered that this process was really good for other things. Some of the tribes developed assessment models using those eight bubbles. They used it to staff cases and to problem solve, to bring in partners, and to do problem solving with several partners sitting around the table as to who could do what for, with this family. They used it to document services and send reports to the court. They used it to plan for new resources and ask to fill gaps. So I'm going to just say, what is a system of care approach? Well, this is a system of care is not a program. It's a philosophy in how services can be provided, how care can be provided that brings together different service agencies 
to address the whole child so it lines up with that holistic model. It's basically responsive to this notion that if you're in a post-colonial society where all of these things are assaulting the family, you can't solve the problem unless you're responding to all of those needs. It is a spectrum of effective community-based services and supports. It's coordinated, it's intentional. People talk about it and sign memorandums of agreement. Um, it is based in the culture of the local community. It doesn't rely on credentials except where those credentials are meaningful to the outcome. So if a child needs therapy, of course, they're gonna go to a, a credentialed professional, but that credentialed professional is part of, the, of that system of care and has equal status to the grandma who's also sitting at the table. And they talk about, now, Problems have to be solved around how do you share information across those different sectors. Confidentiality agreements have to be signed. So there's a lot of work to do it. The principles are that it's family driven. The family's in the best position. They know how to help. They know the kinds of needs that they have and the extended family know the kinds of resources that they have to bring to bear. It's youth guided. Youth will tell you how to do this work. It is culturally competent in the sense that the services themselves are embedded in the culture. It's community-based, it's comprehensive. Services have to be accessible and individualized and coordinated and collaborative across the various sectors. It fits with our indigenous worldview Looking, and I, we refer to this as the relational worldview model at NICWA, where life and problem solving is seen as a balance around this four quadrant circle of mind, body, spirit, and context. And context refers to the relationships that we have, not only with our own family, but with those around us and community and service agencies and the political environment, every, everything around us. Keep in mind this circle represents the entire universe of possibilities. Uh, as opposed to a linear approach in the Western society looks for cause and effect relationships and tries to measure them. This approach to human services is an approach that brings us health through balance. Our um, organization uses this model throughout the work that we do. Because in order to be able to address the needs of families, we have to address all four of these quadrants. And it has to be in balance. And we've translated this four quadrant circle into an organizational development and systems change model. We translate mind into infrastructure of organizations and systems, the body into resources, spirit into mission, and the context is the environment. In order to accomplish something like I was talking about in our example from Alaska, you have to address at a system level, you have to, we have to use our indigenous thought to change systems. In other words, what, one of the things that I am extremely adamant about is that that element of colonialism that delegitimized indigenous thought robs the entire world of the richness of what we have to offer as indigenous people. And by using our indigenous thought, understanding the world through this balance of mind, body, spirit, and context, and translating that to organizational structures and to systems change, 
we can identify what is a healthy system, what is a healthy organization, because what we need then is a balance of infrastructure, resources, mission, and relationships outside that environment, and relationship with what we know our own needs to be. So in order to achieve systems change like this, you have to have a financing strategy. You have to have clear policies for how you're going to proceed. You have to have standards for practice. You have to be able to collect data to know how you're doing and communicate with the outside world. Your systems have to be accountable and dependable because one of the things that's happened in our own communities is when our own systems aren't dependable to our own people, they don't believe in our services. We have to be dependable to first and foremost to our own constituents, our own families, so they believe enough to come to us. What we've, one of the most dramatic changes that we've seen in communities that we work with to do child welfare reform is that the referrals start pouring in. The referrals start coming more because the community sees they're not the kid snatchers that the state was. They really are here to help us. We don't have to wait for bruises. We don't have to wait for abandonment. We can get help when we see, when we have that intuitive sense in our hearts in the child care program or in the preschool or in the rec program or when I see a kid who's struggling, I can get help from them. And maybe when the professionals sit down in a circle identifying a child in need, they can decide who's, who's best equipped to take the lead. Is it behavioral health? Is it physical health? Is it child welfare? And how do they partner across the systems? In the resources, you need leadership. Most of, the, most of the resources we need to do this work are human resources, it's people. If you do this, the money will come because if you bring this circle into balance, it is hard to argue, argue with the legitimacy of the services. The family and the youth voice is a resource. Being able to staff it, getting your staff well trained, getting technical assistance and help, having buy-in all across the systems. These are the resources that we can bring to bear. In this mission quadrant, values, shared vision, cultural integrity. If your services don't line up with your original cultural teachings, throw them away. They're no good. There is no community development, there is no economic development, there is no development that undermines the integrity of culture. It's not, if it undermines integrity of culture, it is not development, it's continuation of colonization. If we are respectful of the ancestral wisdom, if we align our ways of keeping children safe with the principles of who we are as indigenous people, of what we know from the inheritance of our birthright, we will have safe children. We will have good programs. And to deal with the environment, we have to have a good idea of what the needs are. We need to know what our community's readiness is to do this. We need to have the political will across our organizations, across our governance, across our partnerships. We have to have the external relationships to get provincial, state, federal government officials to the table. that at least to help them get out of the way. You know, for the most part, people in the mainstream society want to help. 
but have been so encumbered with the privilege of being the colonizer that they believe that the way to help is the imposition of their own values. We love you, but please stop. Of all of these around the circle, our organization has found that five of them are key. Leadership commitment. It is such a pleasure to see so many tribal leaders here because that's a core element of having a transformation. Transformational change in systems. Stakeholder involvement, making sure that families, parents, youth, elders are part of this process. Building capacity and infrastructure, making sure that you're working on environmental changes at the same time you're working on capacity building. You're bringing those relationships along. You're helping your community. One of the things that we did in the Alaska um, environment was a social marketing campaign. We wanted everybody in the community to know that child welfare was changing. And everybody, you have to con continually repeat the vision and values. Our opening this morning grounded us. That word anchor, that's so important. To anchor our work in those values and the vision because they help the energy go the right direction. Think about this. When we buy into the lateral oppression, when we struggle with one another, where is the energy going? The energy's going like this. The energy's going into struggling with one another. If we're going to stop the trauma, we've got to shift that and our energy has to go out to the people. Right beside me here is an important image. I'm talking about pulling together. Canoe journey. One of the most important learnings that people have when they participate is understanding how to pull together. Our families have to pull together. Our services have to pull together. Our systems have to pull together. Native and non-native have to pull together. So I hope that as we go forward in this work, that we reject that colonial lie that somehow the colonizers have the answers when the answers are in the hearts and the minds of our elders and our youth and our families and our communities. All we, what we have to do is we have to ask them and we have to be willing to say to people, if we're going to decolonize ourselves, if we're going to deal with the social determinants of health that are making us sick, if we're going to be trauma-informed, we have to stop the trauma. We have to figure out the things that we can do in our own communities to follow those teachings of love and compassion and generosity and courage. So I thank you. And I want to remind you if, that we at NICWA hold the 
American Indian Conference on Child Abuse and Neglect every spring. I know many people from Canada come down. This year it's in San Diego or on the Rincon Reservation at, at, uh, at uh, April 2nd to the 5th, so watch for, at the NICWA website for that information. Um, sorry for the commercial. <laughs> One of our board members is sitting here, and she reminded me to say that. So, um, so thank you. That concludes my remarks, and I'm really happy to be here.